Hello and welcome. Uh, we are Tess Bridgman and Ryan Goodman, co-editors-in-chief of Just Security. And we are thrilled to welcome Director of National Intelligence, Avril Haines. Thank you so much for being here with us today to celebrate Just Security's 10th anniversary year. Uh, we're delighted to see so many friends and colleagues in the audience and thank all of you for what you do to support our work in so many different ways. So um, as those of you in the room will know, Just Security aims to promote principled and pragmatic solutions to problems that are confronting decision makers in the United States and around the world. Uh, we try to do this through rigorous analysis of issues of national security, democracy, foreign policy, and rights. And our goal is to serve as a source and a resource for policymakers, journalists, and, and the public in an era in which trusted voices and reliable information are especially vital. We're grateful for our exceptional hardworking staff, a richly experienced and diverse uh, board of editors and advisory board, our leading expert guest authors, and of course, our readers uh, for making Just Security a forum to be trusted on a wide range of issues confronting our country and the international community. Uh, the ecosystem of stakeholders in Just Security's work have supported our growth and reach, enabling articles and resources that we publish to make a real and hopefully lasting contribution. We're also grateful, especially today, uh, marking the 10-year anniversary of Just Security, to NYU Law School and to our institutional home at the Reese Center on Lawrence Security, which is led by the, our phenomenal uh, executive director, Rachel Goldbrenner. Um, we also wanted to say a special thank you to the many people who worked to make today's event possible at the Reese Center, on our staff, at the law school, and including especially uh, Mariana Kozak, for whom without this it would not have been possible. So just thank you to everybody for being here and for being here in the sense of having uh, brought us to this point. We want to, of course, extend a special thanks to uh, Director Haynes, whose principled leadership on so many of the national security issues that we work on at Just Security uh, is inspiring for all of us. Uh, she's served as a mentor to many in the Just Security community, and she is overall an extraordinary leader um, who so many of us look up to for her thoughtfulness, her intelligence, her unwavering dedication to serving the public, and, of course, her humanity. Um, we are also grateful to Dean Troy McKenzie uh, here at NYU Law School, who uh, himself is a leading scholar as well as a public servant, uh, having served as Deputy Assistant Attorney General at DOJ's Office of Legal Counsel. And with that, Dean McKenzie will turn it over to you to introduce our guest. Thank you. Well, thank you and welcome everyone. Welcome to this fantastic occasion because we are gathering uh, both to celebrate uh, Just Security and to hear from Director Haynes. Um, this is a real mind milestone, uh, 10 years of Just Security. Just Security, I think we all know, has provided an unparalleled platform for thoughtful, critical, and diverse perspectives on issues of paramount importance, both to lawyers, to academics, and more broadly to policymakers in the US and around the world. The analysis that Just Security provides is regularly part of our national dialogue in the very highest circles. And the contributions that uh, Just Security attracts are referenced across a spectrum of decision-making points, mediums, and also in uh, legal scholarship, congressional reports, and testimonies. And uh, to, to have uh, been able to achieve this in only 10 years is truly remarkable. Uh, so I want to take this moment to congratulate Just Security, the Reese Center on Law and Security, which has served as a, a home for Just Security. Uh, I think all of uh, these achievements exemplify the commitment that we have made at NYU, both to supporting scholarship as well as informed dialogue and discussion on issues around national security, rights, the protection of democracy and the law. And, um, and really, Just Security is um, an example of why NYU is a leading destination for national security studies in the legal academy. I also want to welcome Director Haynes, who is a true 
Renaissance woman. She brings a wealth of experience and expertise in the field of national security. She is the seventh Senate confirmed director of national intelligence. Um, and she is also the first female head of the US intelligence community. Uh, in the Obama administration, she was assistant to the president, principal deputy national security advisor. Uh, she also played a role uh, as deputy director of the Central Intelligence Agency. She has demonstrated not only um, extraordinary capability, but steadfast commitment to serving this country with honor and distinction and consistent with the rule of law. Uh, I said that she is a Renaissance woman. She actually began her journey into the federal government and, um, and, uh, and public service um, over the last two decades and has been throughout all three branches of government. Uh, she is a, um, a graduate, a senior fellow, former senior fellow at Johns Hopkins where she worked in the Applied Physics Laboratory. Uh, she was also a research scholar at Columbia University. Um, she then found her way to Georgetown where she received her law degree after having received an undergraduate degree in physics from the University of Chicago. Uh, so her background um, uh, combines a number of really remarkable uh, uh, talents. With a background spanning academia, government service, and now the intelligence community, Director Haynes really does epitomize the spirit of interdisciplinary collaboration and dedication to the greater good. And again, I think that is fully consistent with what we have tried to build here at NYU. She is of the law. She acts in policy and intelligence circles with integrity. And I have no doubt that she will bring amazing insights to us here today. So I want to reiterate what a privilege it is for us to have her here. So without any further ado, please join me in welcoming Director Haynes. Thank you so much. <laughs> I hope I can live up to that. Uh, sounds a lot better than she couldn't hold a job, but I, am, I really appreciate. Look, uh, thank you so much, Dean McKenzie, um, for that kind introduction. And, and really, a special thanks to the Just Security team for inviting me to speak with you today. It is truly an honor to be here with all of you, to see so many familiar faces. I have to say it's extraordinary. I see more, even. And to have a chance to wish Just Security happy birthday. I also want to take the opportunity to celebrate the impact that Just Security and the Rice Center have had on just an extraordinary range of issues. Topics that include climate change, counterterrorism, cybersecurity, democracy, disinformation, immigration, international criminal law, Israel, Hamas, Russia, Ukraine. It starts to sound like our annual threat assessment, but <laughs> it is you've built an intellectual community that believes it is possible through interdisciplinary discourse based on scholarship and experience to promote a more just society. And you are a consistent resource for decision makers, analysts, practitioners who work on difficult national security issues, often raising the level of the public conversation and asking provocative questions that help ensure that we're thinking things through. And the work published by Just Security, as Dean McKenzie said, is regularly cited by major newspapers, famous periodicals, government services such as the Congressional Research Center, and read by national security professionals across our community, not only in the United States, but around the world. You truly should be proud of what you built here. And I particularly love the fact that you're featuring a growing list of international voices, including <coughs> authors from countries such as Yemen, Sudan, Syria, Afghanistan, Haiti, Ukraine, and Russia, while also fostering the next generation of national security professionals with a student editor program. And I'm told that there are more than 50 students from NYU School of Law and Yale Law School and most recently Oxford University who have served as student staff editors. And it's my understanding that they receive significant mentorship in their writing. I can imagine what that's like knowing all of you. 
but in any event, and they have opportunities for bylined articles, including with leaders in the field. And as a consumer and a citizen, I just want to thank you. This is a moment when such discourse is not the norm and yet crucial to our capacity to make better decisions. Moreover, I look forward to working with and for some of your alumni in the years to come. So in honor of your 10th birthday, and before getting to questions, which I know is sort of the main point here, I thought I'd just offer a few comments on the intelligence community, the law, our efforts to promote the level of transparency, and how important that is to building trust with the public, which, frankly, we can't do our job without. So I'll start with what is perhaps obvious but worth repeating, which is that it is absolutely essential that the intelligence community follow the law. We can only carry out our mission with the public's trust and confidence, and the public will only have that trust and confidence if they know that we are acting consistent with the law. But of course, given the nature of intelligence activities and the fact that we have to conduct so much of our work in secret, there is an element of trust involved that makes it even more crucial that we get the law right and that we find ways to consistently share as much information as possible about the principles, the processes that govern our work and how we support accountability in our work. And when domestic agencies regulate or the Department of Justice prosecutes, they do so openly, receiving feedback through things like notice and comment and rulemaking and criminal trials. These processes don't mean that there will never be controversy about what those agencies are doing. We live in too big and complicated a country where people disagree on too many important matters for that to be the case. But public debate and controversy, it isn't a bug. It's a feature in our system. Public controversy allows individuals and institutions to course correct, to ensure that they have a sense of what the American people believe is lawful, ethical, and wise. And the intelligence community has unique challenges in this arena. We have, as a country, clearly dedicated and decided that we want to engage in intelligence activities to collect information to keep us safe. The Constitution, a host of landmark statutes like the National Security Act, the Central Inte Intelligence Agency Act, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, and the Intelligence Reform and Terrorism Prevention Act make that clear. And it is not possible to engage in the business of intelligence without maintaining certain secrets. But the reality is that even within that space, questions arise, and our lawyers are often called upon to decide what is within the lines and what is outside the lines without the benefit of public controversy and debate. And this isn't always easy, as the relevant legal sources do not always provide precise guidance. In fact, what Justice Jackson said in Youngstown about difficult constitutional questions involving national security is probably as true today as it was then. The answers to such questions must be divined from materials almost as enigmatic as the dreams Joseph was called upon to interpret for Pharaoh. <laughs> and even when we are dealing with legal sources more specific than the Constitution, we must interpret those sources against the backdrop of a constantly changing national security environment and technological landscape. And moreover, it isn't just a, in relation to the law that we're making such decisions. There are policy questions that arise, obviously, as well, which can be just as challenging and important. And a good example of this relates to commercially available information, which is increasingly important to our work and yet raises important issues related to privacy and civil liberties. Today, not only is an astounding amount of commercial information available to the public, but various actors, including adversaries, also have access to increasingly advanced analytic tools that they rely on, and among other things, artificial intelligence to exploit such information in new ways that exacerbate existing threats such as cybersecurity. And at the same time, as more of our daily lives are connected to the digital world, including through the Internet of Things, the combination of an increasing amount of readily available data regarding the activities of individuals, often perceived as not especially sensitive on its own, alongside increasingly sophisticated analytic tools can in aggregate raise significant privacy and civil liberties issues. We in the IC recognize this fact, asked a number of external experts to make recommendations regarding how and under what circumstances we should use commercially available information, and in particular to reflect on the existing framework 
for ensuring the protection of privacy and civil liberties. We made the report public, are following through on their recommendations, and will continue to make public as much as we can on this issue, because such transparency is a foundational <coughs> element of securing the public trust in our endeavors alongside the protection of civil liberties and privacy. We also recognize the importance of transparency related to our work when it comes to promoting an informed citizenry, which is also crucial to a functioning democracy. We have a transparency initiative at the National Intelligence Council through which we are proactively publishing unclassified or declassified intelligence community analytic work on our website, dni.gov, in case you want to check it out, on a range of national security problems. And with the increasing importance of national security in our everyday lives, the more we can help to inform the public debate around such issues, the better. And in doing so, we try to prioritize analysis on matters of significant public interest while also focusing on threat assessments and related information in instances where the IC's assessments differ from the information contained in the public sphere. And by doing so, our transparency <coughs> serves another purpose, improving our work, exposing our analysis to diverse academic, NGO, other expert audiences, including for external research verification, provides such audiences with a chance to contest our thinking, draw to our attention questions or perspectives we haven't considered, and learn from those outside of our traditional circles. And this is often crucial, as the classified nature and pressure of our work makes us particularly susceptible to a number of cognitive and motivational biases, such that interactions with those outside of our community to test our hypotheses are challenging, but nevertheless essential to our work. And of course, it's increasingly apparent that increased transparency and in the sharing of intelligence on national security threats with allies, partners, and the public can advance our national security interests in significant ways. This is perhaps most famously obvious in the context of Russia's invasion of Ukraine and our related efforts to counter Russian disinformation. But that's only one example among many. In today's world, every significant national security and foreign policy challenge that we face requires us to work with partners and allies, and a shared picture of the threat landscape is fundamental to prompting and implementing any multilateral effort. Moreover, multilateral responses that are sufficiently agile and effective, such as sanctions, export controls, require significantly more intelligence sharing at every level. And perhaps most of all, to effectively galvanize multilateral efforts, we have to understand the perspectives of our allies and partners, their interests and their priorities, which of course requires dialogue and more sharing. And our history shows that voices from outside the government are crucial to addressing the challenges we face. Diversifying, expanding, and strengthening our partnerships is in fact a leading goal in our national intelligence strategy. And extraordinary institutions like NYU and Law and just security with your insights make clear why this is so important. You test our assumptions and you make us better. And I cannot think of more impressive group of people to do so from Rachel Goldbrenner's prior experience serving as a senior advisor to Ambassador Power in the UN to Ryan Goldman, Goodman's work and writing on so many complex legal issues, including most recently the law of armed conflict in Gaza, to Tess Bridgman's tenure in the White House as a special assistant to the president, and Deputy Legal Advisor to Dean McKenzie's role as a Deputy Assistant Attorney General, your collective public-private expertise is truly remarkable and helping to lead the legal change to address our nation's most complex issues. NYU Law's engagement through vehicles like Just Security and Global Issues sheds a light on the role we as citizens and professionals can play both in and out of government to advance solutions to our greatest challenges and hopefully leave our world just a slightly better place. It's imperative for the intelligence community to continue to draw on your expertise. And thank you again, and I look forward to the questions and welcome ideas and other commentary. So thank you. Um, once again, thank you. I have you know, only about three or four hours of questions for you. Um, but at some point, we'll get dragged off the stage. Uh, I wanted to pick up on, on a few themes of your remarks, um, and I actually wanted to read a quote. Um, this is Justice Potter Stewart's concurrence in the Pentagon Papers case. Mm -hmm. 
and I first confronted this when I was at OLC. Um, and and it, it has always struck me as, as an important statement about the way in which national security, intelligence information works, flows, and the challenges um, in that world. So he wrote, in the governmental structure created by our Constitution, the executive is endowed with enormous power in the two related areas of national defense and international relations. This power, largely unchecked by the legislative and judicial branches, has been pressed to the very hilt since the advent of the nuclear missile age. For better or for worse, the simple fact is that a president of the United States possesses vastly greater constitutional independence in these two vital areas of power than does, say, a prime minister of a country with a parliamentary form of government. In the absence of the governmental checks and balances present in other areas of our national life, the only effective restraint upon executive policy and power in the areas of national defense and international affairs may lie in an enlightened citizenry, in an informed and critical public opinion, which alone can help here protect the value of democratic government. And I wanted to start with that because, of course, um, in the world where you operate, um, the checks, the balances are so often internal. And to the extent they're external, they come with transparency. You mentioned transparency, but of course, transparency is not always possible in every single aspect of the work you do. So I wanted to ask you about guarding against misuse of intelligence and surveillance authorities. And if you could perhaps comment on the types of, of internal or interbranch checks and balances that you think are important. Yeah, it's such a huge topic. I, so maybe I'll say a few things and then please dig in where you think is most useful. But I, I think the one thing that, that maybe I'd add to Potter's statement in the context of our work is I do believe an informed citizenship is and citizenry is a critical check in effect on, um, on these powers. But for us in particular in the intelligence community, because so much of the work that we do is in secret, Congress is a huge piece of the puzzle, right? And one of the things that, um, that I find particularly challenging is, so uh, I think if, you're, if you've been in the executive branch and particularly if you've worked in the intelligence community or in national security, one of the things that, it, and I target like the last, um, seven years or so in particular, what you will see is that the intelligence community, we share a lot with Congress. Like it's it, more so than other typical agencies and departments. We're sending up congressional notifications on a base, daily basis, sometimes hourly basis on various things that we're focused on. And there's an extraordinary kind of work. Now that's important and good and useful and I do think part of the system, but it is definitely not sufficient. Like I think that is part of the piece that, that I've tried to, to think about and understand. And so to your point, in part, my view on this is that we do need to continue doing that with Congress, right? And you know, basically pr uh, provide them with everything that we possibly can through the intelligence committees as we're working things through. But we have to proactively think about the contours of our work right, and produce frameworks that help people understand what we do and what we don't do. And those frameworks are frameworks that are important, not just in terms of statutory frameworks, which you already have access to, right, but rather there's a part of it that is, um, for example, uh, producing um, decisions of the Fisk Court, you know, going through and declassifying or, you know, taking out, redacting only what has to be classified, but exposing as much of that as possible so that you can see how the court is interpreting the law in these circumstances and what kind of direction they're giving us, right? Those types of things. There's also frameworks that relate to where we don't have a court, because in, in a lot of national security, the work is done without a judicial 
uh, check in you know, certain areas. And so instead what you have is um, interpretations by the executive branch of how to apply the law in certain areas. And so questions of the degree to which you can then expose that without necessarily providing the details of an operation that's being conducted underneath that framework. And so that's the space that I've long seen the value of occupying but it is not without its challenges, and part of the, the issue is how do you make it a regular course kind of thing, as opposed to the president or some event creating a scenario that forces that kind of issue. And so that has been the thing that I found, you know, that we've been trying to construct more of creating mechanisms that actually lift up and promote, you know, nominate things for frameworks to be exposed. The challenge I would say is in things like the commercially available uh, information one is a good example. Honestly, it takes a really long time. And that's one of the challenges that I think we end up having in government. Like we work through it and then we have to work through, okay, what are the implications if you expose X, Y, and Z? And how does that affect the work and so on? And then you get it through a big process. And that I think is one of the challenges that comes out in this space. But it is, it's fundamental to, it, it's, it's our legitimacy, it's trust, it is also a check, it is all of those things. And the thing about that quote that I find so interesting too, and I've thought a lot about the Pentagon Papers and the moment that that was, but over the decades it's only gotten harder, right? I mean, it's only gotten more important because we all recognize that national security and foreign policy is increasingly critical to the everyday citizen in a variety of different ways. It is also the case that it is, you know, you, you, you want Congress to be the check and you want the American public to feel confident in Congress, but the American public often do not feel confident in Congress. And there's a challenge of trying to ensure that you're getting out as much as you can so that there's a, a better debate and discussion. So I, I'm sorry, I went no, on No, 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 uh, yeah. again, we, we could, you know, there, there, there is a lot to dig in there. Um, you talked about having frameworks and principles and trying to build, build those out and where, where appropriate, uh, greater transparency, not you know, sort of limiting redaction of information and the like. I wanted to ask you, and, and, and again, I, I, I realize that um, you know, this may be sensitive, so I'll, I'll just ask it in a more generic way. Uh, I was struck how certainly in the last several years, in this administration in particular, um, there has been a sense that uh, both in terms of declassification and in terms of giving uh, public airing to uh, intelligence information, more of it was coming out. Um, I think in particular what sparked this in my mind is the run-up to um, Russia's invasion of, of Ukraine, um, which it, it, it seemed extraordinary at the time, but also seemed as though it was not an ad hoc uh, from the hip uh, action. It seemed to be something that had been deliberated on and thought about. Uh, to the extent you can comment, can you talk sort of generally about the move towards um, putting out into the public debate information that perhaps a generation ago or even 10 years ago, uh, the intelligence community might have been very reluctant to, to kind of let go of. Yeah, it's, it's um, I think talking about it in the context of Russia, Ukraine is useful because we've, there's been a lot that's been made public already about sort of the process and, um, and I tend to tell it in a story that, um, that points to a moment, uh, which I will describe, but it is absolutely true that this was a very sort of deliberate um, planning process, essentially, even as it developed, though, we were learning new things and iterating and trying to understand how it was working and where it wasn't and so on. And there were aspects of it, too, that I think, you know, we've, we are continuing to learn lessons from and think about how they apply in other spaces. So to get to the story, I think, you know, we were um, obviously pulling together intelligence that indicated that Russia was really considering this large scale invasion. And, and I'll tell you, I mean, for us, it, it was um, uh, the first um, uh, sort of scenario is one where you're, the analysts are writing this up, right? And many within the intelligence community were like, 
does that really make sense? Is that really, like, is this, uh, you know, are you sure that this is something that's being contemplated? Because, you know, you sort of look at the situation and you think, well, that, like, exactly why would Putin do that? Aren't there some very significant downsides to going down this road, right? And, um, and as we became convinced within the intelligence community and we started to produce this in you know, the President's Daily Brief and things like that to the boss, um, got a lot of skepticism from the policy community who were like, yeah, like, can you show us some more? Where's your homework on this? Like, how do we? And, uh, you know, and so we continued to talk through it. And I remember uh, the, the president saying, you know, he, he was basically said, well, you, we've got to start talking to partners and allies about this and, um, and start thinking about if this happens, what do we do, right? Like, and how do we deal with the situation? And, um, and so, you know, our Secretary of State, Tony, uh, Blinken and Jake Sullivan and you know a variety of folks like Lloyd, you know our Secretary of Defense, et cetera. So they started to have those conversations, and we had a a, a moment where I remember them <laughs> saying, "Well, our allies are pretty skeptical about this. Like they're not really sure this is going to happen." And and that was the moment I remember him turning. But there were sort of a variety of moments like this, right? Like where he was like, "You have got to get out there and start sharing this. Like we have got to." talk to allies through the intelligence community to try to help them understand what we're seeing and to provide this. And, um, and so that was sort of a first iteration from my perspective of then us setting up, in effect, um, an apparatus for trying to do this. And as we were thinking this through, of course, like NATO, the EU, these are the crucial international organizations that we would have to work with that would take action. And so then you start to think about how do you get this out to them on a regular beat? How do we do this? And, and through the sharing, of course, as you know, it's not as if we don't share with these allies and partners on a regular basis, but as you intensify on a particular issue, you learn a lot from those discussions, right? Like they come back and they say, well, I'm not sure about this piece, but we've got a piece of intelligence that tells us this. And you know, it helps you put the picture together in a way that gives you greater confidence about what's happening. And so that was a part of it. But then the second part of it was very much in the context of countering disinformation, right? We knew that Russia was looking to create a pretext for the invasion. And the effort to try to counter that was another sort of iteration of this that was more about not, it, we call it like downgrading to share with uh, allies and partners in effect, but, um, but actually declassifying or trying to do that. And, and of course, and you know, this is also a paradigm that repeats itself in so many different spaces. As you're doing that, you sure as hell don't wanna lose the access that is giving you the insight, right? So you've gotta figure out a way to really think through how you do this in a way that does not actually um, you know, tank your access effectively, and yeah. So, so <clears throat> how then in the next iteration do you resist when uh, you know, let's say there's a, a, the press or um, informed observers say, well, why aren't you sharing the information like you shared in the run-up to, uh, to the uh, uh, Ukraine war? You, you know, you did it then, you should do it now, and if you're not doing it now, could you tell us why not? Have you, have you thought through um, what that might look like because those demands are gonna come? Yeah, so it's interesting because here's, there's sort of a variety of dynamics that enter into play in the kind of scenarios that you're talking about. First of all, there's a view, right, that um, to the extent that we are capable of sharing information more broadly with our partners and allies, so it might be that it's classified, that we can't unclassify it, right, but, but we can do more to share with partners and allies. And you might ask, well, if we can do more to share with partners and allies, why wouldn't you? And part of the challenge is really resources. Like you're, you're writing on a variety of things for President of the United States, you, know, you only have so many analysts that are doing that, you have to think through like, okay, if I make it for release for a variety of folks, then there has to be a second review, there's different things that you have to do. So there is a kind of a, a resource constraint that you've got on doing a variety of things in this area. But, um, but there was so much clear value in doing what we did, right, in the context of Russia, Ukraine, and in other spaces. I mean, it, we focus a lot on Russia, Ukraine because it's the most public example we have. So just recognize that there are other, obviously, things that we do this on and it matters. 
And, and I think increasingly we see in the national security strategy uh, demonstrate this, right? It puts partners and allies in our capacity to work in coalitions as absolutely fundamental and a priority to our national security. So we are increasingly being pushed to provide that essentially intelligence sharing basis for that discussion to make it a better discussion. And so to your point, I think the first answer is we should do more sharing, in other words, right? From the policy community, the view is let's do more sharing and let's try to make sure that we're doing it in the areas that are most important from our perspective to set up for a better national security conversation. That's sort of point one. But point two is if you've got reporters or other folks who are doing that, it's again like if it can be unclassified, it should be unclassified. And so that is, you know, we are trying to do more in that space, which leads to things like the Transparency Initiative and the NIC. Again, it is, you're trying to promote as much as we can to actually push things out so that you can begin to see what it is that we're saying, as I indicated, both because I think it's important for basically educating the public conversation, but also because we get reactions and people tell us we're wrong and they say, you haven't considered this. And it's really useful for us to hear it. It makes our work better. So as we're doing that, I think the, the response is also helping to validate, in a sense, the value of that to the intelligence community. The last thing I'll just note is that one of the challenges is um, it, there's a cultural shift that we're sort of in that is, um, you know, a kind of a longstanding trend, but it's, it, it is an important one to recognize a little bit. Like, our job, our mission in life in the intelligence community is to provide information to decision makers, policy makers and operators, right, so that they can make better decisions. That, that really is like, if you had to boil it down, that's really what we do. and. That is what should be the priority, right? So there's a challenge sometimes within the thing of like, you're asking me to do a lot of other things that are not, are sort of priority one, right? Like, so we do have to think through how we do it in a way that allows us to still do the primary mission that we're focused on. So um, we are in a world in which we have uh, competitors, adversaries, many of which are Author authoritarian regimes, they're not worried about transparency, they're not worried about checks and balances. So let me play devil's advocate a little bit. Um, my heart sings when I hear these types of initiatives, transparency, thinking seriously about putting in place frameworks for greater sharing of information when appropriate. Um, isn't there a risk of degrading our own ability to compete in an extraordinarily hostile environment to give the kind of information that decision makers will need within our, our government. Have, do you have a thought about that response to that concern, that these are all the, the types of initiatives one would expect in, in, a, in a democratic republic, but our competitors are not democratic republics, and we've got to keep that in mind? Yeah. So. Here's sort of a version of how I think about this, and um, I, I would welcome your thoughts on this, obviously, to try. I, so um, I think of the sort of uh, implementation of our values and the um, constraints that we submit ourselves to in the context of a democracy as part of our strength. And, and I'll give you some answer to that. It's not unadulterated, so I want to. I'll come back to it too. But I, part of it is that um, our most important asset in the intelligence community are the people that work there. It is an extraordinary group of talented, really, um, just uh, folks that are not seeking fame and fortune because you're not going to get that in the intelligence community, right? <laughs> and um, people who really want to apply themselves to do something useful and, uh, and often could be paid significantly more in the private sector on a variety of things, and yet they come to work in the intelligence community or in the government more broadly. You see this in a variety of different spaces. Part of what attracts them, I think, and I certainly see this through my own interactions with the workforce, is the capacity to do something for their society, for 
you know, that is consistent with their values, essentially, for what they believe we stand for. And I think that our application of our values in the context of our work helps us to keep that extraordinarily talented group of people focused on their work. That's one. Two is, it is um, one of the things that we see sometimes with authoritarian intelligence services is they get used as a political tool. They're not focused on what's best for the country. They're focused on what's best for that political leader's future or their capacity to do things. That is a drain of resources, in my view, on what it is to do. But it also means that they're not actually helping their leaders make better decisions for their country, right? And that is really a lot of what we set ourselves up for to do. Number three. So much of our strength is derived from our alliances. We recognize that today more than ever, I think, in a variety of ways. We are allied with many countries who share our values. Often, over the many years of my, when I was a civil servant in the government or other things like that, you would have conversations with allies and partners where, in sharing intelligence, they want to make sure that what you're doing with their intelligence is consistent with their law, and that when you're giving them intelligence, they want to tell you what they're doing with it in ways that allow you to feel consistent with your laws so that you will continue to share intelligence. That's crucial. And that is part of the discussion that we have. So when we're talking about new developments in privacy and civil liberties laws, for example, we're talking to our you know, allied uh, services to make sure that we're doing it in a way that will not actually become a barrier to some of our sharing. So that is a part of, I think, the strength. Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't times when the intelligence community comes up and says, if you put this restraint on us, like we understand that you think we should, I don't know, retain information for only X number of years, for example. This is a pretty classic one, right? And um, because, you know, uh, we want to, from a policy perspective, we're thinking through how do we um, manage the data that the government has in an appropriate way to protect uh, for privacy and civil liberties issues. We may raise an issue and say, like, here's the impact of that. There may be some national security, like we could have gotten some value out of that data if we have it for longer. There's a variety of things where we've seen that it's been valuable under those circumstances. So we have that debate. But I think that's an entirely appropriate debate to have. That gives the policymakers and our leaders an opportunity to say, OK, I get it. There might be some advantage to national security, but I think the advantage for us as a country, because we're complying with a certain set of rules in a certain way, is to our advantage in other respects. And I've decided that the balancing act is here, and this is where we're going to cut it off. And I think that's a perfectly appropriate thing for us to do in all circumstances. So, so uh, speaking of, of democracy and, and shared values, we have a presidential election coming up this year. Uh, there is the specter of um, foreign interference. There's the specter of um, emerging technologies, artificial intelligence being used to um, seed and spread disinformation in the, in the campaign season. Um, how can we prepare for that, prevent that, react to that? And, and what, what's the role of the intelligence community um, in, in, the, in the potential fight that we will have on, on that battleground? Yeah, it's, um, honestly, the, the landscape has gotten much more complicated over the last several years, even as I would say that the government's capacity to deal with it has also gotten much better. Like when, um, for me, looking back at 2015 and you know just how challenging it was for us to basically work with local and state election authorities and others to really help them see what the threat was and so on, was just much harder than it is today. And a lot of what we do um, in the context of our work in the intelligence community is really support the Department of Homeland Security and the FBI who are on the front lines of this issue and who have really established those kinds of networks 
um, so that they can provide it and to ensure that we're providing to them through notification frameworks, a variety of other things that we do, basically the information about disinformation that we see that may be attributed to a foreign actor, things like that. And then we also produce analysis that helps us to, um, uh, to inform Congress, first and foremost, and our political leadership of the threats that we see, and then we provide an unclassified version of that that is public that helps people to see what it is that the threat is from foreign actors um, in the context of elections. And honestly, I mean, the thing that strikes me about this is the more educated all of us can become on these issues and understand what is happening out there and in sort of take as much responsibility as possible for dealing with it and actually helping others be educated about it, the better. It is um, with you know tools coming out of generative AI, other things like that, it's just going to become much harder to manage this issue over mm -hmm. time. And we're seeing this internationally. I mean, it's pretty extraordinary to watch some of the deep fakes in the context of elections in a variety of yeah, scenarios. So I'm going to ask you a huge question. Um, these have been really small. No, I know. I these, feel like these, these, these are bite-sized morsels. Yeah, exactly. Um, when I think we, we look out at the adversaries, um, other countries who uh, have relations with the U.S. that cross a spectrum from, you know, quite hostile to um, engaged, but but also um, uh, with the prospect of, of conflict, and I wanted to identify three of those and to ask you how you, how the, the, the intelligence community sees them, differences among them, and the ways in which we are likely to respond. Um, Iran, Russia, China. Uh, Iran, obviously, with uh, groups backed by Iran that have recently escalated in the Middle East um, in ways that we have responded to. Um, Russia, we've already talked about the, the Ukraine war. Uh, we talked about election interference. And China, a main trading partner, but also a country where in the commercial space, military space, there is the prospect for conflict. Um, is there anything you can say, you know, in a minute, uh, <laughs> that, 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 that can sort of shed light on how, how we approach these three very, very different countries that, but in different ways, we have found ourselves uh, confronting. Yeah, okay. I'm, uh, well, let me, maybe the way to do this is just to say here is part of the challenge of the current landscape that we've got, and then I'll get to the three and try to do this as accurately and <laughs> surely as possible. I know, I, like, you're gonna have to grade me on this at this point. The, we're at a moment where, I mean, and I always feel like there's, you know, um, probably this could be said for a few years, but where we're, our threat landscape is increasingly complex and interconnected, where we're dealing with um, uh, sort of accelerating strategic competition between major powers, right, which is where the China-Russia mm -hmm. piece comes in. We are dealing with increasingly intense and unpredictable transnational challenges that intersect with the state actor challenges. And we've got sort of multiple regional conflicts that have far-reaching effects. And on top of that, you put technology, environmental changes, uh, some of the economic strains that we have around the world. And what it makes for is a scenario in which it's both um, the sort of level of instability for a variety of issues is quite high, and our capacity to forecast, which is of course what we're supposed to be doing, so many scenarios, is also very challenging. And so as you go through each of these scenarios, I'll, I'll pull out some differences between them that relate to some of that, right? Like, so if I take just, I'll take your last first, right? China, it is a critical priority for us 
um, because it is so fundamentally important to our future. And the trajectory that the United States has vis-a-vis -vis China and our capacity to um, both uh, counter aggression, but also to cooperate and collaborate where we can in our mutual interest to find a way to ultimately peacefully coexist and promote you know, broader prosperity is fundamental. It is a very long-term, uh, obviously, picture and goal. And one where part of the issue for us is ensuring that we keep our eye on the ball, which is to say that it's not as often the urgent threat the way the Middle East and counterterrorism can be and things like that. And so the capacity to maintain focus and understanding, building out expertise so that we're able to give decision makers a better understanding of the landscape and so on is crucial. And that's sort of how I think about, like, that is where we need to invest. We have to make sure that we are as focused as we need to be on that. Then the second to Russia, um, you know, so often Russia and China are lumped together and yet they are such different national security issues. And, and for Russia, you know, in so many ways, the, the invasion of Ukraine has really kind of accelerated a decline for Russia that I think makes them also increasingly dangerous in many ways. It is uh, when you have less to lose, you're willing to take more risk, in effect, to um, achieve your goals. And, uh, and so as we watch that and, and try to help policymakers again understand what's happening. It's a dynamic, evolving picture where um, we're looking to give them uh, both the kind of indication and warning of various potential aggressive moves, but also opportunities to try to create greater stability in a situation that is very hard to maintain stability around. So maybe that's as short as I can make it on Russia. I know there's so much to say on all of these issues. For Iran, it is, um, you know, again, like just to take the, the sort of what's happening right now in the Middle East and, and look at the different lenses through which this is, through which Iran is, they have um, interacting with the United States. And I'm trying to think how to do this quickly. I, I think of the three that you identified, right? Iran is in the weakest position in many respects. I mean, and, and I think right now we see their economy is under Economically extraordinarily and militarily. pressure. Yeah. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, they have um, supported and facilitated a whole series of um, just, you know, whether it be terrorism, uh, they've, um, they support uh, proxy groups that are attacking our forces. Um, in the region and have been, I mean, now there's been uh, over 100 attacks um, against uh, forces and assets in uh, the East just in, since October 7th. Um, they're supported by them. They support the Houthis and the activities that they're engaged in in the Red Sea. Um, and they are um, without, you know, from our perspective, a destabilizing force in the region. And, um, and yet part of what we have to do, I think, in the intelligence community, and this is true across the board, is help policymakers understand why they're doing what they're doing, what their interests are, how those actions are likely to evolve so that they can sort of get the trade space right for how to manage the stability um, and, you know, and the instability and move forward in a way that doesn't uh, create greater conflict and violence ultimately in these spaces and pursue our interest. And, it's, um, and it is a, a uh, yeah, challenging worst fight. There's a lot to be said about so, all three of these countries. So that, yeah, in, in, in respect of all three of them, I, I wanted to pick up on something you said earlier when talking about the run up to, to Russia's uh, invasion of Ukraine that, and I, I, I can sort of feel myself in the room uh, scratching my head saying, well, this doesn't make any sense. Why would, why would Putin do this? Um, when I think of Iran, um, you know, proxy groups that they're backing, why would you do this? You're, you know, economically weak. You don't have great military power. Why, why sort of go around poking um, other powers? Um, 
I mean, that must be a challenge in your world where you're seeing things, you're seeing intelligence pointing in one direction, but the model we have of how states interact with each other would suggest a rational decision-making process that would lead in a very different direction. Again, another really small question. Um, how, do you, how do you balance that? How do you say, oh, this, oh, this totally makes sense because it fits what uh, we would expect under the circumstances, and this doesn't make sense because it's not what we would think a rational actor would do under you know, some model of international relations. Yeah, it's one of the critical, like, crucial traps that people can fall into. It, it is, um, and it's fascinating, because I think you know, a, a, during my time at Columbia, I got to spend some time with Bob Jervis, mm -hmm. who uh, passed away a few years, a really remarkable um, professor there who has worked with the intelligence community for many years. And, uh, and one of the things that he spent a lot of time on was um, Iraq WMD and a variety of things where we had not, you know, where we'd made mistakes in trying to help us understand basically lessons learned and what we've done. But among the things that I think of him for his scholarship on is, is on this point to some extent, which is to say that often um, we look at states uh, and their actions through our own rational lens and look for them to do what it is that we expect we would do if we were in their position is sort of the right. And in fact, you know, uh, people matter, not surprisingly. And also the culture, the story, the narrative, all of those things are critical. And one of the really great things I think that in the context of the Russia Ukraine piece, and, and you know, there's sort of another side to the going out and telling everybody this is what's going to happen, which is to say that I think for, for all of us, we were also like, boy, I really hope we're right because <laughs> like, this is not going to go well if you know, it turns out, right? But I, I have to say, like the analysts who really work on these issues and are experts and, you know, and in consultation with other expertise, I mean, and this is really where I think um, the community of thought that is in the United States and in, in other countries that gets together and really helps to enrich our thinking on this it helped us to see like you know the the sort of the historical significance of Ukraine to Russia right to the perception of Putin the fact that you know he perceived the breakdown of the Soviet Union as sort of the greatest tragedy of the century the um, perspective of Ukraine moving further away from uh, essentially the influence and ambit of Russia towards NATO, the increasing capacity of their military because of training and other things that they were engaged in, the concern about uh, ultimately if they engaged and actually came to NATO, how that would be, um, how that would affect Crimea, how that would affect, you know, Russia's capacity to continue um, to effectively uh, occupy Crimea and whether or not that would lead into war, whether looking at um, uh, the West, his perception and continued perception that um, his resolve would outlast ours ultimately on these issues, that uh, we would be too tied to the fact that energy prices were high and he'd be able to use that against us to weaken our resolve ultimately, that, uh, you know, that, that he had at the time that he invaded probably the best economic situation he'd had in a very long time with a significant reserve of funds, right? Like, you know, there were just a whole series of things that led him to see like, this is probably my best moment. It's not going to get any better. This is utterly critical to me as a legacy issue. I do not want to be the leader of Russia that lost Ukraine, like this kind of, and, and as you started to walk through it, you began to better understand how it is that it came to his thing. I, another question that we often get is, um, you know, how serious is President Xi about Taiwan, right? Like, very serious. Like, you know, so I, it's like we're, we have to look at things through their lens. And I do think that's a critical piece of what the intelligence community can bring to the table yeah. for policymakers yeah. is that other perspective. So, so the sort of richer explanatory context. Um, so I want to uh, ask you a final question. You, you mentioned uh, Iraq and WMDs. I wanted to ask about mistakes. Um, 
and if you would want to comment on mistakes made within the intelligence community in recent years, um, how you think about sort of, okay, that was a mistake, this is how we respond to it. Um, how do institutions more broadly learn from their mistakes? Or you Over haven't made me. any. Yeah. I know. <laughs> That's like, yeah. I mean, I, I, I personally feel very strongly about this issue in the following way, and then I'll bring it back to the intelligence community. I think it is fundamental that we make space in our society to accept that mistakes get made and that they can then be corrected. It is just, there, I've worked in government for a very long time as a civil servant in different government. It, you know, it happens. And, and the reality is that if you are afraid of acknowledging it, and then you are not going to actually address the problem as effectively. And so I think one of the things that I try to, promote is, first of all, that when we do make mistakes, we acknowledge it, that we then do our best to fix it, and we try to do so as transparently as possible, but it is really helpful when others participate in that in a way that is productive and then ultimately try to help us to, in fact, improve over time. Now, I'll take it in the intelligence community, there's lots of mistakes that get made, and um, now some of them, you know, we focus in on analysis, right? Uh, Rock WMD or other things like that. There's a few things that that I'd say about that. I mean, first of all, I'm extremely proud of um, the times that we get it right, and we get it right more often than we get it wrong. And I will tell you that you don't hear about a lot of the times we get mm -hmm. it right because, well, that's when we've been successful. So, um, so there is that piece of it that I just feel compelled to say, like it really is extraordinary. The other piece is that yes, we do, and and there are places like we've had a lot of discussions, for example, about yes, we got it right about Putin interested in a large scale invasion of Ukraine, right? But we did not anticipate how that, the trajectory of that battle, right? Both in terms of, um, in a sense, the capacity of the Russian military, but also the execution of the Russian military plan. And there are a whole series of things that we've gone back to look at to say, so why did we expect them to be more successful than they ultimately were? And how can we learn from that? And I can't tell you the number of papers that get written on that, right? Like they sort of constantly go back to sort of see, and then we're trying to test it, and then we're seeing, well, if we did that in these scenarios, would we have seen something different, and so on. And, and it is, it's both, um, it's intellectually uh, inspiring because it's, it's actually fascinating to talk through these things and just to give you a sense of some of the things that I think were really interesting about it are things like the fact that, um, you know, we think the fact that the plan was held so tightly, for example, in the context of uh, the Russian uh, invasion, that it actually meant that they didn't, they weren't able to do as much kind of interagency right. consulting, right? To vet, like, to vet it, basically. To vetting yeah. and like <clears throat> logistics with folks that normally would. Like there's a variety of things like that that you sort of go through and what it makes you think about is, okay, it's not just about how many tanks they've got, which of course, you know, our analysts knew this, right? But how many tanks they are, like their capacity to do X, Y, and Z, the ammunition, the personnel, et cetera, but also like how are they planning and how does that affect you know, the battle? So there's all kinds of really interesting, but it's also inspiring, honestly, to see us look at things, figure it out, get better, move forward, try to improve how it is that we do things. And, and I see you know, very much in the kind of man in the arena version. Like, I think those failures are absolutely part of success, right? Like you cannot be successful unless you have some of those setbacks that then help you get better in the context of your work. So, um, so I think important. We also, like, you know, we're in, uh, um, in the midst of FISA renewal discussions, right, with an extension, and a lot of you probably know this stuff, it's, it, it tends to be quite technical, and there are some people who are very deep. But this is, um, you know, an area where, uh, to some of your earlier questions, right, where basically under a statute that we have that allows us to do um, certain collection of foreign intelligence, of non-US persons outside of the United States, under certain circumstances, so on. There's, um, 
we produce, we, we go through an annual certification process with uh, the FISC court, um, Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court. We um, uh, do 60-day reviews within the executive branch that the Department of Justice and ODNI go through to make sure that, in fact, um, when targeting was done, it was done according to the guidelines that were issued, we, you know, that were approved by the court. We do um, semi-annual reports to Congress about this. We do annual transparency reports about this. And we tell people, including publicly, here are the number of mistakes that were made mm. when we were doing this, right? Like this is like what our process is and so on. And that is part of it. And part of what the debate is said is look, you know, first of all, we think you're making too many mistakes and we think you need to reform your system to make less mistakes, but also um, we want to see accountability for those mistakes. And that's the kind of debate that I think is a perfectly rational, like we have to have those discussions in order to be able to get to a better place. So those are two examples of, yeah, the types of things that we do wrong. Great. Um, I want to thank you so much for your thoughtfulness, uh, for being here, for engaging on some of the most important topics facing the country, facing the world. Uh, please join me in thanking Director Haynes. Thank you.